Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Today, darlings, I bring you some Korean folk tales and folklore from Im Bang and Yi Ryuk. If that's not a reason to read it, I don't know what it is. You have to hear what Ryuk has to say. Maybe bring along an apple. Home of the Fairies In the days of King Injo, 1623 to 1649, there was a student of Confucius who lived in Ka Paiyung. He was still a young man and unmarried. His education had not been extensive, for he had read only a little in the way of history and literature. For some reason or other, he left his home and went into Kang Wan province. Traveling on horseback with a servant, he reached a mountain where he was overtaken by rain that wet him through. Mysteriously, for some unknown cause, his servant suddenly died, and the man, in fear and distress, drew the body to the side of the hill, where he left it and went on his way weeping. When he had gone but a short distance, the horse he rode fell under him and died also. Such was his plight. His servant dead, his horse dead, rain falling fast, and the road an unknown one. He did not know what to do or where to go, and reduced thus to walking, he broke down and cried. At this point, there met an old man with very wonderful eyes, and hair as white as snow. He asked the young man why he wept, and the reply was that his servant was dead, his horse was dead, that it was raining, and he did not know the way. The patriarch, on hearing this, took pity on him, and lifting his staff, pointed and said, There's a house yonder just beyond those pines. Follow the stream, and it will bring you to where there are people. The young man looked as directed, and a lee, or so, beyond, he saw a clump of trees. He bowed, thanked the stranger, and started on his way. When he had gone a few paces, he looked back, but the friend had disappeared. Greatly wondering, he went on towards the place indicated, and as he drew near, he saw a grove of pines. Huge trees they were, a whole forest of them. Bamboos appeared too, in countless numbers, with a wide stream of water flowing by. Underneath the water, there seemed to be a marble flooring, like a great pavement, white and pure. As he went along, he saw that the water was of an even depth, such as one could easily cross. A mile or so further on, he saw a beautifully decorated house. The pillars and entrance approaches were perfect in form. He continued his way, wet as he was, carrying his thorn staff, and entered the gate and sat down to rest. It was paved, too, with marble and smooth as polished glass. There were no chinks or creases in it. All was of one perfect surface. In the room was a marble table, and on it a copy of the Book of Changes. There was also a brazier of jade just in front. Incense was burning in it, and the fragrance filled the room. Besides this, nothing else was visible. The rain had ceased, and all was quiet and clear. No wind nor anything to disturb. The world of confusion seemed to have receded from him. While he sat there, looking in astonishment, he suddenly heard the sound of footfalls from the rear of the building. Startled by it, he turned to see. When an old man appeared, he looked as though he might equal the turtle or the crane as to age and was very dignified. He wore a green dress and carried a jade staff of nine sections. The appearance of the old man was such as to stun any inhabitant of earth. 
He recognized him as the master of the place, and so he went forward and made a low obeisance. The old man received him kindly and said, I am the master and have long waited for you. He took him by the hand and led him away. As they went along, the hills grew more and more enchanting, while the soft breeze and the light touched him with mystifying favor. Suddenly, as he looked, the man was gone. And so he went on by himself and arrived soon at another palace built likewise of precious stones. It was a great hall, stretching on into the distance as far as the eye could see. The young man had seen the royal palace frequently when in Seoul attending examinations, but compared to this, the royal palace was as a mud hut thatched with straw. As he reached the gate, a man in ceremonial robes received him and led him in. He passed two or three pavilions and at last reached a special one and went to the upper story. There. Reclining at the table, he saw the ancient sage whom he had met before. Again he bowed. This young man, brought up poorly in the country, was never accustomed to seeing or dealing with the great. In fear, he did not dare to lift his eyes. The ancient master, however, again welcomed him and asked him to be seated, saying, This is not the dusty world that you are accustomed to but the abode of the genie. I knew you were coming, and so was waiting to receive you. He turned and called, a saying, Bring something for the guests to eat. In a little, a servant brought a richly laden table. It was such a fare as had never been seen on earth, and there was an abundance of it. The young man, hungry as he was, ate heartily of these strange viandes. Then the dishes were carried away and the old man said, I have a daughter who has arrived at a marriageable age, and I have been trying to find a son-in-law, but as yet have not succeeded. Your coming accords with this need. Live here, then, and become my son-in-law. The young man, not knowing what to think, bowed and was silent. Then the host turned and gave an order, saying, Call in the children. Two boys of about twelve or thirteen years of age came running in and sat down beside him. Their faces were so beautifully white they seemed like jewels. The master pointed to them and said to the guest, These are my sons. And to the sons he said, This young man is he whom I have chosen for my son-in-law. When should we have the wedding? Choose you a lucky day and let me know. The two boys reckoned over the days on their finger. Then together said, The day after tomorrow is a lucky day. The old man, turning to the stranger, said, That decides as to the wedding. <laughs> now you must wait in the guest chamber till the time arrives. He then gave a command to call so-and-so. In a, in a little, an official of the genie came forward, dressed in light and airy garments. His appearance and expression were very beautiful. A man, he seemed, of glad and happy mien. The master said, Show this young man the way to his apartments and treat him well until the time of the wedding. The official then led the way, and the young man bowed as he left the room. When he had passed outside the gate, a red sedan chair was in waiting for him. He was asked to mount. Eight bearers bore him smoothly along. A mile or so distant, they reached another palace, equally as wonderful, with no speck or flaw of any kind to mar its beauty. In graceful groves of flowers and trees, he descended to enter his pavilion. 
Beautiful garments were taken from jeweled boxes, and a perfumed bath was given him, and a change made. Thus he laid aside his weather-beaten clothes and donned the vestments of the genie. The official remained as company for him till the appointed time. When the day arrived, other beautiful robes were brought, and again he bathed and changed. When he was dressed, he mounted the palaquin and rode to the palace of the master, twenty or more officials accompanying. On arrival, a guide directed them to the special palace beautiful. Here he saw preparations for the wedding, and here he made his bow. This finished, he moved as directed further in. The tinkling sound of jade bells and the breath of sweet perfumes filled the air. Thus he made his entry into the inner quarters. Many beautiful women were in waiting, all gorgeously apparelled, like the women of the gods. Among these he imagined that he would meet the master's daughter. In a little, accompanied by a host of others, she came, shining in jewels and beautiful clothing so that she lighted up the palace. He took his stand before her, though her face was hidden from him by a fan of pearls. When he saw her at last, so beautiful was she that his eyes were dazzled. The other women, compared with her, were as magpies to the phoenix. So bewildered was he that he dared not look up. The friend accompanying assisted him to bow and go through the necessary forms. The ceremony was much the same as that observed among men. When it was over, the young man went back to his bridegroom chamber. There, the embroidered curtains, the golden screens, the silken clothing, the jeweled floor were such as no man of earth ever seen. On the second day, his mother-in-law called him to her. Her age would be about thirty, and her face was like a freshly blown lotus flower. Here a great feast was spread with many guests invited. The accompaniments thereof, in the way of music, were sweeter than mortals ever dreamed of. When the feast was over, the women caught up their skirts and lifted their sleeves, danced together and sang in sweet accord. The sound of their singing caused even the clouds to stop and listen. When the day was over, and all had well dined, the feast broke up. A young man brought up in a country hut had all of a sudden met the chief of the genie, and had become a sharer in his glory and the accompaniment of his life. His mind was dazed and his thoughts overcame him. Doubts were mixed with fear. He knew not what to do. A sharer of the joys of the fairies he had actually become, and a year or so passed in such delight that no words can ever describe. One day his wife said to him, Would you like to enter into the inner enclosure and see as the fairies see? He replied, Gladly I would. She then led him into a special park where there were lovely walks surrounded by green hills as they advanced, there were charming views, with springs of water and sparkling cascades. The scene grew gradually more enchanting, with jeweled flowers and scintillating spray, lovely birds and animals deporting themselves. A man once entering here would never again think of Earth as a place to return to. After seeing this, he ascended the highest peak of all, which was like a tower of many stories. Before him lay a wide stretch of sea, with islands of the blessed standing out of the water, and long stretches of pleasant land in view. His wife showed them all to him, pointing out this and that. They seemed filled with golden palaces and surrounded with a halo of light. They were peopled with happy souls, some riding on cranes, some on the phoenix, some on the unicorn, some were sitting on the clouds, some sailing by the wind, some walking on the air, some gliding gently up the streams, some descending from far above, some ascending 
some moving west, some north, some gathered in groups. Flutes and harps sounded sweetly. So many and so startling were the things seen that he could never tell the tale of them. After the day had passed, they returned. Thus was their joy unbroken. And when two years had gone by, she bore him two sons. Time moved on when one day, unexpectedly, as he was seated with his wife, he began to cry, and tears soiled his face. She asked in amazement for the cause of it. I was thinking, he said, of how a plain countryman living in poverty had thus become the son-in-law of the king of the genie. But my home is a, my poor old mother, whom I have not seen these years. I would so like to see her that my tears flow. The wife laughed and said, Would you really like to see her? Then go, but do not cry. She told her father that her husband would like to go and see his mother. The master called him and gave him permission. The son thought, of course, that he would call many servants and send him in state. But not so. His wife gave him one little bundle and that was all. So he said goodbye to his father-in-law, whose parting words was, Go now and see your mother, and in a little I shall call for you again. He sent with him one servant, and so he passed out of the main gateway. There he saw a poor thin horse with a worn rag of saddle on its back. He looked carefully and found they were the dead horse and the dead servant whom he had lost restored to him. He gave a start and asked, How did you come here? The servant answered, I was coming with you on the road when someone caught me away and brought me here. I do not know the reason, but I have been here for a long time. The man in great fear fastened on his bundle and started on his journey. The genie servant brought up the rear, but after a short distance of the world of wonder, had transformed into the old weary world again. Here it was with its fogs and thorns and precipice. He looked off towards the world of the genie, and it was but a dream. So overcome was he by his feelings that he broke down and cried. The genie servant said to him, when he saw him we weeping, blah, blah. when he saw him weeping, you have been for several years in the abode of the immortals, but you have not yet attained thereof, for you have not yet forgotten the seven things of earth, anger, sorrow, fear, ambition, hate, and selfishness. If you once get rid of these, there will be no tears for you. On hearing this, he stopped crying, wiped his cheeks, and asked pardon. When he'd gone a mile further, he found himself on the main road. The servant said to him, You know the way from this point on, so I shall go back. And thus, at last, the young man reached his home. He found there an exercising ceremony in progress. Witches and spirit worshippers had been called and were saying their prayers. The family, seeing the young man come home thus, were all aghast. It is his ghost, they said. However, they saw in a little that it was really him. The mother asked why he had not come home in all that time. She had been a very violent woman in disposition. He did not dare tell her the truth, so he made up something else. The day of his return was the anniversary of his supposed death, so they had called the witches for a prayer ceremony. Here he opened the bundle that his wife had given him and found four suits of clothing, one for each season. In about a year after his return home, the mother, seeing him alone, made application for the daughter of one of the village literati. The man, being timid by nature, and afraid of offending his mother, did not dare refuse, and was therefore married. But there was no joy in it, and the two never looked at each other. The young man had a friend whom he had known intimately from childhood. After his return, the friend came to see him frequently, and they used to spend the night talking together. In their talks, the friend inquired why all these years he had never come home. The young man then told him what had befallen him in the land of the fairy, and how he had been there and had been married. 
The friend looked at him in wonder, for he seemed just as he remembered him except in the manner of clothing. This he found on examination was very strange material, neither grass cloth, silk, nor cotton, but different from them all, yet warm and comfortable. When spring came, the spring clothes sufficed. When summer came for those summer, and for autumn and winter each special suit, they were never washed, yet never became soiled, they never wore out, and always looked fresh and new. The friend was greatly astonished. Some three years passed when one day there came once more a servant from the master of the fairy, bringing his two sons. There was also a letter saying, Next year the place where you dwelt will be destroyed, and all the people will become fish and meat for the enemy. Therefore follow this message and come, all of you. He told his friends of this and showed them his two sons. The friend, when he saw these children that looked like silk and jade, confessed the matter to the mother also. She too gladly agreed, and so they sold out and had a great feast for all the people of the town, and then bid farewell. This was the year 1635. They left and were never heard of again. The following year was the Manchu invasion. When the village where the young man had lived was all destroyed, to this day, young and old, in Kao Pyong, tell this story. Okay, that didn't end how I thought it was going to. What about the second wife? <laughs> was he not punished for that? Did she go with them? Uh, all of you, bring all of you. Did that not mean the whole village? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Um, the word choices were interesting. Coming from the late, the translation was from the late Victorian era. So, yeah, I don't know if I would have called them genie. That uh, it's a different part of Asia altogether. I like the... I guess if you're going to compare them to fairies, why not gin? Um, <laughs> whatever. Thank you for joining me, my darlings. It means a lot to me when you come and listen to me. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters. Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings.